Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 315 is with Miranda Hawkins from the podcast, The Deep Dark Woods. Uh, good morning. I'm doing well, and yourself? Absolutely fantastic. Man, I want to dig into this because you are proving to the world where podcasting really originated from and how it continues to be this storyteller. Because it was all about the writers in the very beginning, back in the 1980s. It wasn't about disc jockeys or comedians. And you're proving that, wow, this is a fantastic medium. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's such a big compliment. <laughs> well, the way that you break down Cinderella, I had no idea. I mean, I mean, it, 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 it blows me away that there are so many different levels of this story. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, it was difficult, actually, because that was the first one that I worked on. It was difficult to decide what to put in there because there's so much more to it. So I have to be really specific, right? Um, especially with a story like Cinderella, which there's so much out there. Some of the stories are a bit easier because there's not as much and it's much more direct. Um, but with Cinderella, I mean, you can go on and on and on. So there are some things I didn't even get a chance to touch on. It's, it's almost like every country has its own version of Cinderella. Yes. And that's that's actually like one of the debates about some of these stories is like, you know, where do they come from? And for some of them, because there's so many, it's like, you know, is it something that all of us humans can um, click with. And that's, you know, that that's why all these stories pop up everywhere. Or do some of these stories have one origination and then it grows from there. So it's, it's a constant debate that's still being happened, like are still going on right now. Well, one of the things that I've learned in my studies is the fact that, well, through Native American spirituality is that the you know people traveled from the east across the top through Russia, down through Alaska and over into our area. And so as they went through those different regions, they carried the stories with them. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's not quite the same. I mean, a little bit because these have been westernized. Um, that is kind of something that I've looked into as well. But it's more like it's just different people have like picked it up. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it came overseas, it's more like Walt Disney and them. It was really Walt Disney that picked up some of these stories. And a lot of them actually come from Perot more wow. so than the Brothers Grimm. So it's really more of the French author that they picked up from than the, the Grimm brothers. Wow. Um, and that's been a big one. That's one of the main things I've run across is for a lot of these, I call them the big three. You have the Italian author, Basile, the French author, Perot, and then you have the Brothers Grimm. And each of them have their own takes on it, but they all tend to build off of each other or have their own versions of these stories, so. You know, there's one thing I wish creative writing teachers would do is discover your podcast because I want them to understand that there's more to a story than what we're really getting off those pages, that there, you know, there's such a connection. And that's what I find so amazing about what you've done on this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, honestly, like, that's kind of the thing that really I wanted to bring to life is all these adaptations, you know, all these different stories. It's really a snapshot of where we're at in society at that time or what that culture is trying to teach. Um, you know, it's more than just the morals. It's like, uh, for example, the Grimm brothers, them specifically, they take out a lot of sex, mm -hmm. but they leave in the violence um, because it's also their way of teaching young women how they're really supposed to be or how they want them to be in that culture. Whereas Perot, there's a lot of conversation about him being a feminist because he is a lot kinder to women in his stories, um, especially like Little Red Riding Hood. Um, he's like basically telling young women to be careful of predatory males. And like, what a, you know, that's what he's considering like a wolf. Um, and then All Sleeping Beauty, he's the only one that doesn't have like a non-consensual um, touching of any kind. There's no kiss to wake the princess. It's <laughs> the, the prince just gets there in time, so. It, it it just it just blows me away to hear you explain it because my mind is going through every single story that my mother shared with me or that I watched with Walt Disney and and it's like it's like I want to go back and rewatch these and and see the deeper meaning and purpose and 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 go ahead and take a look at the darker side of what this really means. Yeah, and low key, it's like some of the research I do is having to go back and rewatch those movies, so it's been kind of nice getting to revisit that. But it is different because uh, these older tales, they do come from an era here in the States, you know, where women were still kind of like quiet and silent, like in Cinderella again, you know, it was a nuclear family and really putting a lot of pressure on that. Um, there's yeah, there's definitely so much more to it than people realize. And it's something that I've been learning as well. You know, I started this with one idea in mind 
And as I'm getting through each story, and I still have a few more to do, I'm coming out with a whole different view of all yep, of it. Yep. And it's it's just, it's fascinating. It's something, <laughs> I'm so happy that they let me do this, to be honest, because I've, I've grown up on this. I love this. Um, but now, like, I see these stories in a completely different light. So, Man, you just described my emotions when I was driving because I thought to myself, oh, okay, okay, it's going to be about Cinderella, blah, 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 blah. But the more and more I got into it, I, I, I got giddy. I got, I got happy. I was like, oh, my God, I'm learning something here. <laughs> I love hearing that because that's also how I felt, too. Um, but I did Rumpelstiltskin, yes. surprisingly, because I was not a big fan of that story. I never have been, but I was like, I feel like this is one I, I need to do. Learning about the history of where that one came from and how it was like a children's game and everything, I just found it so fascinating. I love these little tidbits of history that I get to pick up with these stories. Um, and that was a big one. Honestly, Hansel and Gretel, turns out that one's my favorite one that I've done so far. And it still still is. That has not changed. And that one has so many adaptations, which, which I think is fascinating because there's I think there's just so much to say from that story. Right. And we can just do it in so many different ways. So and, and you reveal with Hansel and Gretel, though, that it wasn't the stepmother in real life. Uh, yeah, well, it was it was their mother. So, yeah, it was their biological mother. But the thing is, you know, everyone thinks the Brothers Grimm collected these tales um, from the people. They did not. They predominantly collected these tales from people of the middle class, from like French descendants. And they did a lot of editing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they changed a lot of things. And one of the reasons they did that is because motherhood was supposed to be sacred. So therefore put it all on the stepmother. So it's her fault. So then, you know, mothers don't have to like, mothers can necessarily be redeemed, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure how to phrase that, but yeah, you know what I'm saying. How, how do we get YA readers to go into this? Because this seems to be their kind of storyline in the way where they, you know, they're, they're going to learn something, but they're also going to be given permission to go explore. And I just want YA listeners and readers to really get into the deep, dark woods. So I think some of it, what I would really like is, you know, authors, like authors like Marissa Meyer, she's someone yeah, I interviewed yeah. to, you know, maybe put something at the end of the books or whatever, like this comes from, you know, this, but maybe just like if people realize where these adaptations are coming from, that it'll open a door for them to read these originals, but also like maybe some required reading. Cause I think that there's a lot of really important, I don't know, morals to learn yeah. um, and just like an understanding of where we've come from, right. To see how far we've grown. It's, it's a way to like, look back at where we were and just see where we're at now. And that would be a really great class, something to look into. Um, yeah, um, more than just like, you know, maybe a family member passing a book down, which is, I love and I'm so happy that happened to me and other people, but I know that there are other opportunities out there. So, and I think the other thing is for people not to be afraid of sharing it with a younger audience, because I think there's this yeah. like, thought that we have to yeah. protect them. Uh, which is not necessarily true. Kids are way more resilient. Kids have to deal with a lot of harsh realities. And honestly, stories are a way of teaching them. Um, I know like whenever things got tough for me, sometimes I would look toward these stories. And I think that's why even now, like if it's a fairy tale of any kind and, you know, whatever adaptation, I tend to dive into it regardless. So. Every author is a great reader. So therefore, you being someone who studies reading, uh, who's your favorite author? Where, where are you getting your energy from? <laughs> okay, so I have two favorite authors, one from when I was a child and one as an adult. I have multiple, but the two most influential as a writer. Um, when I was a, a child, it was, I think her name is Tamora Pierce, uh, but she writes like the lady who rides like a knight. Um, and she wrote all of my favorite books when I was a kid. I loved all of them. They're, I loved it because it was like a woman who wanted to be a knight, but she had to go like undercover <laughs> uh, because women weren't weren't allowed to be knights at the time. And then as an adult, it's been Neil Gaiman. Uh, wow. He was the first horror that I ran across. It was American Gods, and I just fell in love with his style. I've read pretty much anything I can get my hands on by him as well. So those are my two biggest ones. I'm actually about to dive into a book that he wrote for another episode that I'm doing that'll be out in a few weeks, um, which I'm very excited about, but yeah. But also like his Sandman, like his graphic novels as well. I was so happy when they did 
their adaptation on, you know, on screen on Netflix too. So those are my two biggest ones. There are others, but as far as like influence, like my influence, that's where they come from. Yeah. The reason why I brought that up is because so many times, you know, and, and I'm, I admit it, I, I'm not just, I'm not just arrow. I am a piece of every radio disc jockey that I listen to growing up. So, and I also believe that authors are a piece of every one of the people that they read while they were growing up. Yes. I, and that's the thing is I've read, Oh goodness. My mom actually had to stop buying me books because I would finish them in a day. <laughs> yes. So we lived. <laughs> that, yeah. That's like a real thing, man. That makes me sound like such a nerd. Um, like when we would like after school, when she picked me up, we'd go to the bookstore and we, you know, sit there and read and I'd mark my, you know, remember where I was and we'd come back the next day and we did make sure to buy things. So we weren't putting the bookstores out of business. Um, but yeah, we'd go to the library and she only let me check out so many. So that's why I think it's so difficult because I've read so many different books, so many different authors. I mean, I've kind of read across the board. Um, yeah. And everything, even if it's bad, I still finish it because I don't remember who told me this, but a mentor said, if you want to learn how to write, you have to know the good and the bad yep. and you read the bad and you figure out why was this bad or why, you know, why did this not uh, appeal to you? Yeah. And that's just as important. So. Wow. Wow. So in reality, when you go in there and you listen to the Cinderella and the Hansel and Gretel and, and you, and, and you dive into little red riding hood in reality, weren't these true crime stories before it became cool? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, Hansel and Gretel, yes, it comes from the Great Famine. People were starving. Um, it did get to a point where people were abandoning their kids. And it, but it was more an attempt to save them, you know, because, like, there just wasn't enough food to go around. But there were also people eating other people because yeah. there just was not enough food. Yes, it's very gruesome. Um, and Little Red Riding Hood also incredibly gruesome actually that was one of the few where i had a visceral reaction i was like i would love to not read about um a little girl eating her grandmother's teeth again once was enough um <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah they do they do come from very dark backgrounds you know i think i think a lot of times in majority stories are written as a way for us to try to understand things whether it's understanding ourselves understanding the world around us you know understanding the complexities of human nature and i think that these fairy tales one of the reasons that that they have stuck around is because these are concepts that are still consistent and that are even though they're adapting and changing they're not going away mm -hmm. they're still going to be there mm -hmm. so yeah one of the things that you've you've proved on the the deep dark woods is is the fact that you know we all heard the story of what london bridge is really really is about and then and now you're showing the same thing that london bridge is falling down uh you know it, it involves books as well that there there is a, a a darker side or there's there's a reason why it was put into play yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, I think uh, Hansel and Gretel is probably one of the best episodes to show that where it's like, here's where it started. Here's where it went. Here's where we are again, you know, circling all the way back around because this is not going away. Right. Mm -hmm. This is still an, uh, a problem that we're having. And until we do find a solution or until it does go away you know, this story isn't going anywhere, regardless of how we tell it. See, so. and, and that's why I'm so inspired about what's going to be happening as the future grows. First of all, we came out of this lockdown. I believe that many authors are going to come out from this lockdown because they had a lot of time to do to do things. I also believe that we're going to have masters on the pages after the war is over in Ukraine, as well as Gaza, because because of those dark times, the stories are coming. These brilliant stories yeah. are coming. Yes. No, they absolutely are. Um, you know, and I, you know, we'll see what it is when they get here, but yeah. this is, I mean, we're living in this massive moment in history. And, and I know we look back and we're like, oh man, you know, I don't know how that they, you know, people survived the great depression. I don't know how people survive this or that, but we're in a moment now where people will say that about us, right? They're going to say that about us, about this, this time in history. So this, the stories that are going to come out of this are going to be reflecting this era, this moment. And I don't know. It'll just it'll be interesting to what people what people have to say and what their takeaway is going to be and kind of like where we're going to go next with it, because that's not something you know, we, we really have any insight about the what's next part. Right. The, the world is also moving so fast now. Yeah. We're so interconnected, but things are just different. 
Yeah. I don't know. It, it'll be really interesting. I've always thought of Walt Disney being a hidden speak writer. In other words, he can take a subject and he can use hidden speak to make it a brilliant love story or, or a children's story. And, and yet, yet what I love is the fact that you give us the truth behind the story, but it also reveals that Walt Disney is a hidden speaker. Yes, absolutely. Um, the thing, though, with him is... <laughs> he does give us both, but at the same time, some of the things he pushes, you know, are still re like relevant to the time period when mm -hmm. they came out. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily like the best thing, in my opinion. Um, but it is true about the hidden speak, right? Um, but I, I am glad that there are like there are adaptations so we can shift those perspective again looking back at cinderella from his time when it was like a nuclear family the idea was you know you're happily ever after is um getting married and you know being taken care of where now it's you know women have more options can take care of themselves you know we don't we don't need that to be okay but at that time you know that's that's what that was so it's still you know beautiful movie still very much enjoy it but i think it's also really important to understand what these things are saying but the interview that just dropped today uh, with dr gina jorgensen she's a folklorist she is also talking about this um, other person who did these interviews with young kids to see what these young kids were taking away from it and it's not quite what you would expect so that's also fascinating in itself uh she calls she calls it kids brain meat yeah. um, which i think is uh, kind of a fun term but yeah they're not just these little sponges that absorb exactly what's being told so don't you love having conversations with authors but that's the reason why i created the podcast view from the writing instrument because we know what the words are but we don't get to hear their inflection yeah yeah and it's also you know I don't know how much is from them, how much is from the world around them, because it's their interpretation mm -hmm. of the world, right? And when I spoke with author Marissa Meyer, one of the things I really appreciated about her was that she doesn't just write what she knows, she writes what she's curious about. And I had not <laughs> heard that before. And I love that. And that, again, was for me another shift in how I view writing and how I view stories and how I view, you know, how other people interpret the world. So that that was a big one for me. That's something I'm still sitting on and chewing on myself. Yeah. Where can people go to find out more about you and really dive into what it is that you've brought to the world? Well, I haven't, I just made it. I have an Instagram, a professional Instagram. It's underscore the underscore Miranda underscore makes underscore. Sorry about all the underscores, y'all. Instagram has so many handles these days. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the best one. That is where I put stuff uh, about the podcast and also some, you know, behind the scenes and all the other great producers I get to work with, uh, you know, their work as well. So that is a really good way um, to kind of keep up with me and, you know, kind of everyone else too or the other people I work with at least. Excellent. Well, you've got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I've had a great time. I really appreciate it. Will you be brilliant today, okay? All right, you as well. All right, bye.